Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, we're recording yeah. and we're live. Uh, we good morning, well. comrades. You are listening to WHIV LP New Orleans 102.3. This is Good Morning Comrade. We have a couple very special guests today. We have, uh, what is it, your fourth time or something on here? Yeah, something I basically like live here. Yeah, yeah, you're like a part yeah, of the yeah. furniture now. You're like a part totally. of it. Um, totally. but yeah, we have Megan Romer back on the program. And we also have first time guests, uh, Chris Curley. Uh, a couple of freelancers on the show, and and we're going to talk about how cool and good freelancing is, and every freelancer. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess uh, do you want to just like do a quick introduction? Uh, Megan, gonna go first. Sure. My name is Megan Romer. Uh, I'm based out of Lafayette, Louisiana. So I'm in Southwest Louisiana, as opposed to it's the other side of the state from New Orleans. Um, I am a, a freelancer, I'm a mom, I'm a DSA co-chair of our little chapter out here. Um, I'm loud on Twitter, I'm loud in real life, I'm good at poker, um, and I'm a good cook. cook. That's it, that's my, that's all of me. Yeah, and Chris. <laughs> yeah, I'm Chris Curley, um, also a freelance writer, stay-at-home dad, um, based in New Orleans, member of DSA New Orleans, also a member of the National Writers Union's Freelance Solidarity Project. Um, and yeah, very active in DSA. Um, and honestly, in a funny way, I uh, never thought that my um, life as a freelancer was going to factor much into my life as a socialist. And that has all been <laughs> fairly dramatically in the last month or so. <laughs> well, there, there is no single discrete issue ever anywhere in the world. No, 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 no thing is an island. And I guess to kind of pick it right up on that, uh, there's been, so um, DSA, we talked about, we've been talking about this a lot on this program. Uh, DSA is involved in a campaign to pass the PRO Act specifically. Uh, and there's a certain subset of, um, first off, the PRO Act is great. The PRO Act would be like the most transformative legislation to like labor law in the United States since the New Deal. Uh, it like outlaws scabs. It basically um, outlaws specifically for the so what we're going to talk about today, um, the misclassification of workers as sort of 1099s or employees. And uh, a certain subset of uh, freelancers, uh, freelance writers, uh, mm -hmm. have spoken up about this. So uh, can y'all tell me a little about what's going on with the, with, with the freelance part of the world and, and, and their orientation of the PRO Act? Chris, you want to take us off? I'll kick it off. I feel like Megan has the stump speech. I, I, uh, I this is my uh, third interview about this, and I, I think I get increasingly angry and incoherent with each one. Um, but, <laughs> but, uh, long story short, um, there was a law in California, um, that called AB5. Well, it, it gets complicated, but the, the main thing being that. It reclassified, um, 1099s who were many who were misclassified, um, into employees and it affected labor law, um, but it also and affected employment status. Quickly, and, and uh, like, independent contractors. To be, yeah, to be sorry. Independent, <clears throat> my bad. Independent contractors. Um, anyway, so it, it led to a lot of publications um, in California because it, California is just one state um, dropping a bunch of freelancers and move, like basically allowing them to take jobs and uh, move to freelancers in other states. So people lost jobs, people lost income of this particular subset. Um, no matter how beneficial it was to lots of misclassified workers. And it used this thing called the ABC test, um, which determined uh, basically whether or not a person was an employee. And the thing that freelancers are uh, really honing in on is this thing called the B prong, the B part. And it's basically like you have to, in order to be considered not an employee, you need to do business that is not in the regular business of the the, the employer. So for freelancers, if you are writing for a publication, the regular business of a publication is to publish articles. Okay. So in the initial sort of um, thing with the product, the product also features the ABC test. And mm. what I've told lots of people, my myself included, um, I am very pro worker and I honestly probably would have been pro the pro act regardless if it, if it affected me, um, directly. But the reality was I also was like, Oh shit. And so, oh, damn it. See, I've already You're squared. Fine. I'm sorry, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> but I was like, Oh dang. Oh gee. Um, I wonder if this is going to affect me and my work. And lots of people in NWU and just freelancers in general were, con were concerned because we just didn't like know. And so 
we got with labor lawyers and we talked to people who knew what was going on and in, inscribed in the act itself is just that it only affects the National Labor Relations Act, the NLRA. Mm -hmm. It affects freelancers' ability to collectively bargain. Because really importantly, and I want to get this out up front, when you're a freelancer, when you're a 1099, you're technically also your own business. So you cannot actually get together with other freelancers and organize, say, a better wage for you. This is important when we talk about content mill type stuff too, by the way. We'll talk mm -hmm. about that later, I'm sure. I definitely want to. But the but the, the thing is, because you're your, your, your own business is sold as such a great thing, you actually, it would be considered price fixing because <laughs> you're all your own little businesses if you were to actually get together and collectively set rates. So wow. actually opposite of the PRO Act being bad for freelancers, it'd be really great for freelancers. Yeah. And yeah. most importantly, the big thing that people are harping on is this California law, which redefined employment status. The PRO Act only affects collective bargaining. It does not affect federal law regarding how you're classified as an employee. So if the PRO Act passed, you would be able to collectively bargain, but you would still be able to set your own rates. You would still file taxes as a sole proprietor or however. It would not change anything about your business. It would simply mm -hmm. change your ability to potentially, potentially collectively bargain for better rates, better conditions, better benefits. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. would rule. Yeah, it would be, yeah, be great. It would be so great. Yeah. It is absurd that like Amazon can take over the entire world and is not uh, faced with any trust busting legislation or enforcement or anything. And right. yet a bunch of people making 23 grand a year. If we're like, no, we're not working for less than what, uh, uh, averages out to 10 bucks an hour got together and said that mm -hmm. we'd be the, we'd be the big bad monopolist because nothing makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, you mentioned the, the spiciest thing that I'll, I'll, that I'll say for this. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. No, go ahead. Is, is, is <laughs> I want to sneak this quote in somewhere, but it's very clear that a certain subset of freelancers <laughs> took the concept of be your own boss, meaning do the boss's work for them. <laughs> Oh no. Yeah, there's okay. We'll get into this, yes, for sure <laughs> later. Because these people, you can't just like, all right, fine. Yeah, you're a small business owner. Congratulations. You are, but let me tell you how I feel about business owners as a socialist. So if you want to put yourself in that category, mm -hmm. by all means, let me just tell you how I feel about you, though. I mean, that's not even true. Like, I obviously like like people who own restaurants and stuff, it's fine. Mm. But you can't exploit your workers, even if you are the only worker and it is yourself. <laughs> well, that's the important part, right? The the, the exploitation of your oh, workers. It's not okay. <laughs> now, you the thing that really grinds my gears is that they want to wrap themselves up in this pro worker. They want to they get credit for being pro worker while directly opposing the most significant pro worker legislation in 70 years. And this is a, a point at which it becomes very clear. And you see a lot of them. I know a lot of them. Like, I know some of these people. Um, and they are people who would self-identify as liberals. You know, they're girl boss, Warren voter types. This is one of those moments when it becomes very clear that there's this, it's not a spectrum mm -hmm. between the right and then all the way to the left. Mm -hmm. There is a power analysis that you either have or you do not have. Yeah. And you are either <laughs> a person who believes that workers need more power or you're a person who believes that bosses should have as much power as they can possibly scrounge up because free market. That's it. Like there's not, it's not a spectrum. There's a line and <laughs> it's very clear who's on which side of this line. Yeah, it's this or that. Which is very annoying to me because I did not believe that for a long time and I'm very frustrated to have learned it because it means that I was wrong. There's always a lot of things. things in stark relief though. It's nice to see things in, in clear terms, even if like like even if it is like a little bit more complicated, like mm -hmm. in reality, or at least in sure. certain different ways. Like the fact that like things are at least for a minute clear for you helps. Me. Well it also like when you sort of the thing about gaining a power analysis 
is that it uh it provides a unified yeah. theory that maybe you never had before right you don't have to like reckon with all these little loose threads it's like nope actually everything is answered <laughs> so and you know our friend kaylin says all the time like you know the bosses are marxists right <laughs> like they're absolutely marxist they just think it's great <laughs> that that <clears throat> this is how the power is divided absolutely i forgot there was some 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 ceo of some horrible company who like did his like uh you know thesis on like you know like gramsci or something you know what i mean like you see sometimes people like read this stuff and they're like ah a roadmap for me to crush people <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> They're like, they read the thing with the conditions and it's like, yeah, the workers, like the bosses have all the power and they're like, sweet. <laughs> like, how do I sign up? That, so just to kind of like get a little bit on a, on a tangent here, there's also like, so if you think about people like Kamala Harris and Pete Buttigieg, like both of their parents were Marxist like scholars and <laughs> college professors. And so like, it's almost like they pay, they pave their way for their kids or the kids at least take a, like some of that analysis and just apply that to like just destroying worker, workers and communities. Yeah. I mean, you got to rebel somehow, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There, but as Chris that. and I, 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 I Chris and I are both yeah. parents, and we're both like, "Be careful with them kids." Well, Chris. you know, but but I thought I thought about this specifically, like this this dynamic that you're talking about, and 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 you cannot escape the fact that, as you were noted, those are parents who are both academics. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I'm not saying there's something wrong with academia per se, but my question is, well, there's a lot of wrong parents, with academia. Yeah, but I mean, I'm not going to get into that. But uh, like, my question is, you know, were they dragging them to meetings? Were they doing direct actions with their kids? Like, to me, yeah. it's like, like if you're like, there's a difference between you can be an amazing theorist and I can benefit greatly from your theory. Um, but but there's something about it being your community and your home and your understanding of material conditions and stuff like that. And um, well, let's say, I mean, whatever it is, they clearly didn't get that lesson. So, you know, as <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you just look at the difference between somebody like Naomi Klein, who was like raised by organizers who were organizing and like, right. but I don't know. I mean, who knows how kids yeah, are. You don't, to, you don't need to do fortune telling on, uh, on that. But, yeah. <laughs> it's too That's scary to think job. about, actually. <laughs> Uh, anyway, you are listening to WHIV LP New Orleans 102.3. This is Good Morning Comrade. We have Megan Romer and Chris Curley on the show, uh, a couple of freelance writers. And uh, so you brought up just a minute ago, uh, Chris, uh, the large content mills. Uh, and how they uh, sort of like treat their workers. Um, I guess, to, could you just describe like what are these content mills and what's the problem with them? And then we can sort of like start from there. Sure. Um, actually, I'm pulling up my old notes. I have like extensive <laughs> notes from the last content mill I worked for. Um, so just like briefly, a content a writer has got his notes. <laughs> I did. When I was working for them, I'm like, these people, I hate them. I'm going to document everything. Um, I have screenshots from Facebook group. I never even turned it into anything. It's just like my burn book. Um, but <laughs> so like top level, like content mills in the earlier days of Google, they're just moving, they still exist is actually the thing. What it sounds, it is what it sounds like. People churning out huge amounts of copy for pennies on the word. Um, freelance, freelance, mm. be your own boss, uh, getting paid three cents per word for an article. Mm. And um, <clears throat> it's a typical, I mean, honestly, it's a typical factory structure. If you go down to it, you've got the, the capitalists who own the country, company, you have all the strategists and salespeople who sell content in bulk. Um, you have man managers in between, quality assurance at the very bottom of the pole, you have writers. And they sell these big packages to companies who need content for their websites or content for their marketing pushes or whatever, because the web is entirely driven by, by content, by words, um, which has led to a completely Dickensian uh, ecosystem of writers, honestly, getting paid the same wage as Dickens basically got paid, um, uh, you know, in the 1800s. Um, no, but like, <laughs> but, uh, but no, it's not, it's not that far off. I mean, 
And so these mills, they were really they were really big in the earlier days of Google before Google kind of caught up with them a bit. And now they exist more. They play slightly better because I need writers who can write a little bit better to escape the algorithms, but are essentially still the same damn thing that they always were. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, one thing I talked about a lot with uh, with some folks uh, on other interviews is that. You know, most freelancers, most freelance writers, if we're talking about specifically, that seems to be a lot of the anti-pro actor, specifically freelance writers. Um, it is a, a living defined by precarity and feast and famine. Um, the people who are most driving this stuff are the ones who have succeeded one way or another. Sometimes it's just by selling the same stuff back to other freelancers about how you get to be successful. Mm -hmm. But, you know, most of us, most of us, and they want to claim the entire like identity of freelancer, but most of us like just get about just about get by. And some days we do some months we do really well and some months we don't. And the reason that I work for these content mills and have even as recently as a couple of year or two ago, even though I have a really established portfolio, I am a very good writer, uh, is because sometimes you just don't have the work and you need to make some money. Right. And and that's the precarity. And like so just to give you an I an idea, um, Let's see. Uh, let me just let me just take a quick look here, because okay. So so I worked for um, I'm just going to name them because I haven't worked for them anymore, and I'll be damned if I ever work for them again. But there's one name that's and shame, good. baby. Yeah, I'm naming and shaming. I'm naming let's and go. shaming. Go. There's a uh, there's a there's a pretty prominent content mill called the Hoff. and oh, they are based out of California, and they absolutely weaponize. Um, like feel good, liberal BS kind of, you know, they sent me a, oh, I signed on, I got, you know, they send you the stress ball and like all like little care package. They're half branded hot sauce and all that. Here are their rates. $40 for a 500 word article, $130 for a 2000 word article. Um, that at the time, this is a little bit older. This is from 2018. So it's a little bit outdated, but trust me, they haven't suddenly become magnanimous in the last couple of years. Um, I did some back of the napkin calculations. I mean, like, you know, the writer essentially of is getting, you know, like 20%, 10% less of what, uh, of the total value. Cause I was also getting sponsored ads from the sales side while I was working for them. So I could see what they were selling these packages for. <laughs> you're the but the point is, of, I mean, you're, you're the target of your own work. Like you're. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, so, you know, if you were to write a two thousand dollar word article and you want to make twenty five dollars an hour, right? Like a like an like an okay, better than fifteen rate, you'd have to write that in an hour, including edits and revisions, research, everything. Which, as you know, Megan, is impossible. <laughs> it's really hard. It's impossible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The only like mill work I was ever able to successfully do that would make any money was the absolute like most like pablamy trash like here are 10 things to do with curtains <laughs> or like like eight places you never thought to put a throw pillow um oh. those kinds of things <laughs> right like that stuff where you're just like all right let's just churn out words just yeah. just and it's like all filler and it's all garbage that was the only time i was ever able to make that work at mm -hmm. all Absolutely. But yeah, we've all done it. Like literally anybody who is a full-time freelance writer who tells you they never got into content mill work lies. Lie. You have to, you have to. I'll say this. They're, they're lying or they are. See, I'm like a second generation writer. My dad's a freelancer too. I actually, my dad has never been in that thing. place and doesn't really understand. Yeah. So funny thing is I've never met Chris in person that we've been Twitter mutuals forever, but I have <laughs> met. Chris's dad and his mom in person at a conference <laughs> for a an early like pre bubble content place that we both wrote for. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually not a bad gig, um, I have to say. It was at not least a mill, pre, it was a real yeah, it was it until Google Panda. That was the okay. So here's a funny thing Google about Panda. freelancing. Google Panda was an algorithm update that killed content mills um, essentially in. Wow. 2005, does that sound right? Something like that. Mm -hmm. um, they com It's when they completely redid their algorithm because before that, SEO, search engine optimization, just meant you just like said the thing as many times as you could in the article. Um, 
So you'd be like, <laughs> right. I'm writing an article about pencils. Pencils are my favorite thing to write with. I sure love pencils that are number two pencils. And then you like at the top, like in the in the the heading of the page, be like pencils hyphen number two pencils hyphen. I sure like pencils. Um, and that tricked Google. And so that was right. there was like an era in which right. the web got stuffed with content and it was all trash. Yeah. Um, right. Still true. It's just sneakier now. <laughs> we have to get better at our trash. That, that's, um, the insidi- like, that's the insidious thing about the the current content mills is that they are they are doing writer tests and expecting like real writing and still paying garbage. Right. Mm. Yeah. So the the model now is clickbait. Clickbait mm. wasn't the model in two thousand five. Now it's clickbait because now social media drives content. And so you have to write something that's clicky. Can you define click like for the purposes of of this, what clickbait is? Yeah, it's just uh, sort of generally just something that makes a person want to click often with a promised upsell on the far end, right? Like Mm -hmm. this one great trick for, you know, making your cheekbones higher or whatever yeah. or we'll never believe this, you see this celebrity naked mm-hmm. yeah. yeah um that kind of stuff that's mm-hmm. or 150 <laughs> different you know whatever as you can whatever with your whatever also quizzes are clickbait oh. often right like which type of pizza is your favorite and which friends character does that make you yeah. um that sort of thing that stuff, I've written it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have definitely written it. And if you can get like some of the better, um, better, you know, uh, more prestigious, like I have a couple of bylines at reasonably prestigious places where the thing I wrote was absolutely a listicle clickbait bullshit. <laughs> Bull- yeah. Dang it, I did absolutely. it again. Right. <laughs> uh, no, we, um, we, sh- we should have a little, we should have a little scoreboard, Megan, between you and I. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm actually up. writing uh, down the time for for Jeff, so he knows okay. where to go back. So um, I guess, like, so uh, there's so many things that y'all have brought up that I have that I have so many questions about because I don't know anything about this world. So, like, the idea of so so SEO specifically search engine optimization is like what, what is one of the things that these content mills do so that they go higher up in the algorithm right mm-hmm. how does that work you said it, you said it's not just mentioning the same thing over and over again but like i, how I, does I, it I think I've probably, I, I think i've probably done it more recently than megan's i can probably okay. um and stay kept I need town. To the show. I need people to get, they'll start listening to it. <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm on top of SEO too, but I'm actually curious what you have to say. I'm um, only relating to how content mills deal with the SEO. Oh, right. Think, yeah, yeah. Which is to say that I watched it change a couple of times um, when I was at the Hoth. So when, when I first started doing some work for them, they had a, you know, so what happened was you had the Google Panda update, which killed all of the old content mills. And then the new ones that arrived were basically like, well, we have to figure out, we have to finesse the within the algorithm. So they'd be like, you need, if it's a 500 word article, you need to mention the keyword three times. And if it's a 1500 word article, you need to mention the keyword once in the H1 tag, once in one of the H2 tags, but not more than once and three times in the bot or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm just like riffing, but it's, but it's, it, they, they, it was a schema where they were, they got more granular about how to basically evade detection. Um, and <clears throat> that was how it worked up until uh, even a couple of years ago, because Google keeps updating. And so now I don't know what the latest and greatest is, but I, so maybe Megan, Megan knows a little bit more, but I know that they even went away. They even went further away from that like specific thing to being like, we have a mix of general keywords and we need to hit all of them in there, but we can't be like too over, you know what I mean? So basically they adapt, they, they adapt their intelligence. I assume they pay their SEO people well and continue to crush their writers. <laughs> <laughs> There's a separate scheme, a separate hustle in being an SEO specialist at a lower level. Like there are real SEO specialists who are like algorithmic brain geniuses or whatever. But there's yeah. a, a lower level hustle where you are like, I'm an SEO expert, which I could totally sell. Like I have enough clips that I could sell myself as that. 
um, if I wanted to do that for my job, which sounds so bad, but people do it. Um, <laughs> and you go through somebody's website and mostly you make their keywords denser, which is a lie. And the whole thing is a, a scam because um, the thing that it doesn't Google work. is always trying, but their goal is to serve the best content for any keyword, right? So mm -hmm. they are going to do it. So they keep revising and revising that algorithm constantly. They literally have like giant teams of brain geniuses working on this. Now there's another hustle called content marketing, um, which actually means a few different things. There are a few different content marketing definitions. Um, but one that, you know, I see them pop up in my LinkedIn a lot, like here, try check out this content marketing job. Usually what you're working for is a brand or a product or an agency. Um, I actually got offered a job <laughs> writing, um, being a content marketer for a breast pump company. <laughs> and what my, I would would have done with my days is go to various parenting forums and type in just discuss breast pumps with deep links about that would send people to our website, mm -hmm. um, and also to contact bloggers, especially mommy bloggers, and try to get them to link from their website mm -hmm. to our website because the links themselves build Google juice. Like having a deep link on a different website uh, bumps you in the algorithms, mm -hmm. possibly, probably, depending on the algorithms that week. That's why Wikipedia ranks so high, allegedly, because everything is deep linked, right? Like it's all those blue, blue links. Mm -hmm. That's a deep link. So you get to know all this incredibly stupid, horrible stuff about how companies are going back and forth trying to game each other. Mm -hmm. And you get paid $4 an hour for the privilege. <laughs> it's a cool mirror of how capitalism operates like in, in minor. It's, um, it's an incredible amount of BS and, and, and busy work um, for almost no like real material value. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So. And then there are these, um, you know, these like on my own boss types on Twitter telling us, well, if you were any good at writing, you would. And I'm like, look, <laughs> I have read what you wrote, Evil Kim K. There's an Eve. Okay. There's good Kim K, Kim Kelly, the labor reporter mm -hmm. who's great. We love her. We love that um, Kim Kelly. Yes. She's yes, in, love in Alabama right now. Then there's yeah. Evil Kim K who is a hashtag girl boss, who is a freelancer and she's awful. And I'm not going to say her whole name because, <laughs> but she's evil Kim K. And anyway, she told me that I must not be a very good writer. Otherwise I'd be a super successful freelancer, but also maybe I could just buy her um, $650 how to be a good freelancer program or whatever it is, because there's also this MLM scheme that you, Marketing. and the content mills often have those too. Like if you recruit a writer, Oh, you yeah. get it's oh it's it's so oh, bad yeah. and it's such a scam and the whole thing is so bad and but, yeah whatever <clears throat> no no it drives you <clears throat> but i saw the same thing happen to uh you know um i don't know if y'all saw that article the e tammy kim uh op-ed mm -hmm. in the new york times that came out um, uh, i actually yesterday got interviewed for that article chris <laughs> I talked to Cammy, Tammy on the phone for like an hour, but apparently my part was when they, they cut it for the times to fit. I'm, I'm secretly very sad. Like I kind of um, wanted yeah. to be quoted at times, but it's okay. I'm no, really happy because it's a great article, but. What is the article? So the article, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an article, Tammy, Tammy's a, a, a freelancer. She's also another, another member of, of uh, NWU and the Freelance Solidarity Project and is a, uh, she wrote an article op ed for the Times, um, and she interviewed a bunch of pro and anti uh, pro act folks. And she, you know, it, it, it's, the headline was "Freelancers Shouldn't Have Horror Stories." Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it, and it's about how it would give freelancers rights, and the, the backlash that she got from it from the anti pro act people. Um, it just reminded me of it, uh, Megan, because they basically you had people telling her that um, you know. Uh, I don't want organized. I don't want to pay union dues. I do very, very well on my own. I don't need a union to negotiate for me. Maybe your career isn't as successful as mine and you need all that help. Don't try to shove it down everyone else's throat was one reply to her. I'm just going to read a couple of these. They're great. And then another person was like, you're a very privileged writer with a Yale degree and a stint at the New Yorker and plenty of me major media outlets. You'll be fine. 
<laughs> and she's like, well, when you love the pro act, but you're a failure, but also extremely privileged. And it's kind yeah, of, it kind I, of encapsulates the entire dynamic that we're facing right now as freelancers who support the pro act. And it, and it does nothing other like, like both of those kinds of like attacks are not any kind of a critique of the system that exists. It assumes that it's not good. And everything is on the individuals that's making the critique, which is just like such a typical thing that you see and how people talk about like uh, about where people are at like in our society. And that's a thing that's really getting me like I've seen a lot of like, oh, so you want to put all these women and disabled people out of work. And it's like, no, actually, I want women to not and, and men and anybody who has a baby to not have to be like, how on earth am I going to pay for child care and also work? And also, you know, that should not be a thing that people have to figure out how they're going to do. I mean, I know so many freelancers who are making 20 grand a year, but because the cost of childcare, it's cheaper to just stay home and like scrape together a bunch of weak yeah. freelance articles. You're literally yeah, no, talking, I, to right now you're talking literally about literally talking to one of them. Yeah, it's no, like, that's exactly where I was when, before Malcolm was old enough to go to school. Absolutely, yeah. exactly where I was. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And like, also, um, how dare they? First of all, you're a misandrist. Second of all, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Dad can stay home with their babies too. But but right, right, okay. Um, <laughs> no, but you know, this actually one. This, this, I don't, I don't mean to like, like Bogart your your, your interviewing style, Jeff. But I, I do want to really talk about this um, existential uh crisis i think that freelancers are forced into by the nature especially like freelance writers like into by this stuff and it's really this the pro act uh the anti-push has really highlighted a lot of that um, and i know megan probably has a lot of thoughts on this too but i mean one one thing for me is like <clears throat> being a freelancer prior to getting becoming an organizer in dsa and becoming or joining nwu meant that your existence was really in a silo right like you're hustling and you're doing this work and you don't have to answer to a boss instead you have to answer to a bunch of bosses and um but you're you get to work from home there are there are flexible there are genuine flexibility benefits but you learn how to do everything on your own and you don't have anyone necessarily to lean on. You don't have connections. You don't have coworkers. You don't have comrades. You don't, you know what I mean? And so a lot of freelancers, I have a lot of empathy for freelancers who are scared about this proact stuff. Um, I have rage for the people who are ringleading them, but I have a lot of empathy for the folks who are kind of caught in the middle, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's because we're not, I, I'll just, just, just to share just even a, even a feeling of difference is that, the, the freelancers who are in the Freelance Solidarity Project and who are in the NWU, it's a completely different feeling than it ever was just freelancing by yourself. And there's a reason why the folks of us who are talking together, organizing together, sharing pay rates, sharing horror stories, sharing pitches, feel so supportive of this thing that is, again, only going to help freelancers and is definitely not going to harm them. I just want to keep making that clear. Um, <laughs> feel a sense of... Uh, pride and togetherness, you do not get togetherness as a freelancer. And so what you end up with is, like I said at the beginning, we live lives of precarity and the idea of a threat to that, an already precarious employment is very scary. And it's easier to throw in with the big influencers who are like, this is going to ruin your life than it is to believe, no matter how truthful, the folks who are saying, no, we can get together as a collective and make things better for everybody it's it i yeah. understand the fear i really do well and, and that fear is exactly what the boss relies on isn't it, it that, that isolation that fear that like precarity is exactly what they want because if that's the case you're very you, you become very jealous of the position that you have and you never want more you don't want to lose what you got that's right yeah Absolutely. I'll just drop the mic after that one. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, you are listening to WHIV LP New Orleans 102.3. This is Good Morning Comrade. We have Megan Romer and Chris Curley. We're talking freelancers and the PRO Act. So uh, I guess to kind of um, touch on this a little bit further, like specifically to build on what we were just talking about in terms of the sort of isolation that fr freelancers feel, have you all been talking to other freelancers about the PRO Act and getting sort of like building a counter narrative to uh to this you know i don't know if it's a prevailing narrative but it's definitely one that's that's being 
pushed of of this being you know bad for f freelancers yeah for sure there's so um it sort of happened accidentally uh but not entirely um but there is a small group coming out of dsa we're working on getting bigger we're trying to find more people um so if you're in dsa and you're a freelancer you know at me on twitter and i'll, I'll uh i'll loop you in with the with the details because i know there are more of us for sure though still not nearly as many as DSA members who are misclassified workers or who are like straight up gig workers for companies that they that are um, absolutely should be paying people as employees like Uber and Lyft. Um, but yeah, so uh, it it is a small group. I don't know what there are, maybe uh, 10 of us who are pretty active and maybe another couple dozen who are less active and then a couple dozen after that who just watch mm -hmm. um which is not very big for a dsa group right it's like usually pretty easy to rally a lot but it's a very specific job and it's yeah. um <laughs> and uh yeah so but anyway yes part of what we're doing is that we are actively talking about like okay so how are we going to shift the narrative what are we going to say what's our messaging who are we going to reach out to one thing that we have but also Evil Kim K also has this, but we have lots of press connections. Like we've got, I know like a zillion editors. I know a zillion writers. Um, I have tons of followers on Twitter because of being a freelancer for forever. Um, yeah, so we're using what we have, you know, our our <laughs> our clout privilege to for good. <laughs> I'll say on the um, the freelance solidarity project side because it's actually it's actually interesting to look at the differences. There are a couple of us in FSP who overlap into DSA. Charlie H, Scott Hines, a couple other folks who are who are. I know oh, I'm going to turn down here. So actually, funny story about sorry to interrupt. Uh, he came down here for the first break light clinic, and he like was taking pictures and stuff. That Sorry. is correct. He's a he's a blue jack now. He's a, he's he's really he's really taken off over the years. But yes, he and I know each other because of because of being at that first brick light clinic. And he was doing that was when he was you know more of a uh, like a lot of us more of a closeted socialist. You know, I mean, it's really the only the per the pro act time that I've really come out of my shell on my professional account um, about uh, about work pro worker stuff because mm -hmm. I had a lot of fear for a while about just like how saying stuff on my professional side would limit my job opportunities. I mean, right, that's, that's another piece of pressure. Like I, mm -hmm. I can't actually express my like deeply held beliefs um, because it might like hamper my ability to get future gigs. Um, but on the, on the FSP side, like, like, like the, these anti pro act folks, like they definitely had the head start on the social media because a lot of them came out of these like big Facebook groups that were organized against AB five in California. So they already had like a sort of huge, you know, organizing base of people who are upset and people who were also, by the way, genuinely hurt uh, by AB five, right. They were hurt. I want to be clear. They were hurt. Not they wait. They were told they were hurt by the law, but they were hurt, hurt by the companies that made the decisions. You know what I mean? Like, I, I want to be clear about that. I think. It, it is true that the the law, it, it, you know, was a catalyst, but but ultimately we got to put the blame where it actually lies, right? Right. Um, but uh, so on the freelance software project side, um, there's been a really really coordinated and I think very fruitful effort. Um, folks getting interviewed, folks making placements. So there's there's there is the growing this week and the next and the week after you're going to see a lot of pro freelancer pro narratives to push things back um because you know our membership like really believes in it we understand the importance of it we understand solidarity and again i i feel and i want some more freelancers to feel and understand what solidarity means and when how it can benefit all of us and i understand why many of them have never had the opportunity because our entire society is geared to keep us away from each other and to keep us from uh, collectively organizing and feeling the strength and the power that is inherent in that. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's why so many companies went to a freelance model in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. It's you pay people less, you have more control over them. You, um, I mean, it's just, it, it's a sweet deal for bosses. It really is. <laughs> Can I tell you my craziest myself as a misclassified worker story? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so right out of college, um, I was hired as a proofreader at Hasbro, the toy company. 
And uh, the way that Hasbro was doing it, this is, of course, I graduated right into the uh, financial crisis, um, right? So uh, I, I, was, I graduated in the uh, the spring of 08. So as soon as basically it was it was it was happening while I was there, and um, <clears throat> so I was hired as a proofreader. And the way that Hasbro did their hiring, they might not still, but they probably do. What they did was they would take on people as temps. And they would take them on for six months and then let them go for three months and then rehire them for six months. And that way they never had to pay them as a full-time employee, right? And this was a W-2 go through a temp agency. So it wasn't actually a 1099. It was definitely still misclassification, right? And so um, they wanted to keep me on longer, um, which I wanted to continue to work there. And so I became a 1099, but... I, because I was the 1099, they, uh, you know, independent contractor, so to speak, I was doing the exact same job in the exact same building with the exact same people, with the exact same email. Um, <laughs> I was not, I had my credentials revoked to be in the building. And I also wasn't able to have a, a tr an actual desk or an office like I used to, because I couldn't, because if you worked in a building, it was a very clear label violation. If you're working at the same desk at the same place as the thing before, so to cover their own butts, I uh, had to every morning make sure I was there on time, off the bus, by the way, uh, <laughs> all in 10 degree weather. This is in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, which is where their headquarters are. Um, had to make sure I was there with the throng of people entering during the day so that I could sneak in without scanning a key card that I was not given to go sit at a unoccupied desk for most of the day. Couldn't leave for lunch unless I had a partner who was also an employee who could scan me back in and then would come back and do my whole day. And that was how I lived for probably another six months or so. And I remember my boss calling me in uh, at one point being like, you know, I feel like your work's really like declined recently. <laughs> and, and, you know, I wanted to know if you wanted to like, maybe try to like pick it up a little, like kind of get it back together. And I was like, no, I think that I should just go. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, and that was the day I quit. And uh, uh, and then worked, uh, you know, for twelve dollars an hour night shift at a hotel for a while. So, you know, it wasn't the step up exactly, but it was. But I mean, just 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 as an illustration of the lengths that a company will put a worker through to be able to save money and like right. continue to misclassify them. It was I was doing proofreading. I was doing some copywriting and, you know, oh, it's cool to work at Hasbro. It's like, well, it's still it's still it still sucks to be treated like, mm -hmm. you know what? Like you barely even live there, you know, like. <laughs> Oh my and god, that's, yeah, terrible. That's part of how these companies that actually misclassify actual workers yeah. get away with it. Um in and and you see so much in very specific industries, places like construction. Like mm -hmm. there's no desk that some inspector can come and be like, What what desk? He's yeah. on the roof. It's yeah, a different right. roof every day. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. it's uh and and the con the contractor who's doing all the roofs is moving to different houses every day. Like there's plausible deniability, um, which is why we have to close that loophole. Like right, it, right. you cannot, a roofer has to get paid as a roofer if they work for a roofing company and they have to have hazard pay and unemployment and uh, health care and all like, I mean, health care shouldn't be tied to employment anyway. That's bad. And I, I, that's an argument that you know is on the side of this but right now it is tied to employment and right now people don't have it because it's tied to employment and you know how we get healthcare? we actually form a mass movement of organized people and demand it that's how yeah. we get there so I mean, a lot of union jobs have health care don't they it's weird how that works out huh, funny that so yeah i mean that's uh, uh chris no, no, I mean, I think you bring up a really, really important point there, too, though, which is like, uh, well, first of all, that these uh, antis, I'm just going to call them antis, I don't want to feel like saying anti pro act the whole time, but these antis are, um, that sound more nice. Anyway, these antis are uh, often cite the statistic of being like, there's like 60 million, you know, freelancers or independent contractors. And like, dude, those are not all freelance writers that are doing the, the stuff that you're doing. And I, I, I almost feel a little bit bad that um, freelance writers are sucking up so much airspace 
contract right now because so many uh, independent contractors are are not in this really like as as precarious as stuff is like a still fairly privileged position that we're in and you know the, the fact is just that like writers love to talk about themselves and so there's a lot of press about writers who are into it and writers who aren't into it and like ultimately like writers we don't make up that big of a percentage ultimately of these misclassified workers these 1099s these 60 million this is not wrong about these 60 plus million numbers of independent contractors just most of them aren't keyboard jockeys like myself and Megan, you know, and like there's there's a whole realm of, of misclassification out there. Um, and then the second point that I would make is just that like, it is really hammering home, like, like what is going to be more effective for us as freelance writers? Is it going to be the ability to collectively, for instance, strike? Like what are the things that the PRO Act enables, right? Is secondary strikes, it enables, right? Like enables other industries to strike like in um you know, unison with with those who are also striking and solidarity yeah yeah solidarity right and like it, it, one thing i was pushed by this today by um an interviewer from strike wave and it made me really think about it which was like yeah so you have all of us freelancers who are in silos and like does not only could we get together and like like bargain collectively fight in a way that we couldn't before, legally couldn't before, but like we could also strike in solidarity with other freelancers and other companies. The potential for us to raise our collective lot is really profound. And again, I just think in some ways, it's just that so many freelancers have no experience of collective yeah. action whatsoever, that it seems like we're talking like, like fantasy and fiction to them rather than something that is like very real and understandable once you get it into it what seems maybe impossible before you do yeah no you, we could you, set let me an idea real quick no, no, um, you were listening to whiv lp new orleans 102.3 this is good morning comrade uh we have chris curly and megan romer go ahead megan okay well i was gonna just say we could set freelance rates and the uh for example the in-flight magazines could all become freelance rate certified magazines and i guarantee you the the flight attendants union would be right there with us if we wanted to like make that a thing i've written for union magazines they don't pay that well so like union magazines would all become free like all these things are connected mm -hmm. and we are so uh sort of we've been cut off from labor history and we don't understand what it looks like to have a strong labor movement. Like we literally don't understand. We can't make sense of it. But I, but you know, France does a new thing every week and it goes viral every week. This week it's farmers dumping manure on like the house of parliament or whatever it's called in <laughs> France. And everybody's like, France is so good at striking. Well, guess what France is also good at organizing. Right. And if we were better organized, we could do cool strikes like that, too. <laughs> so um, you bring up a really interesting point, too, because, I mean, I, I'm thinking a little bit about this and I'm, I might be veering a little bit out of my own lane here. But, like, I imagine if there's an organized set of workers that, uh, like, in the freelance industry, in the media industry, for example, um, more broadly, you would see when, you know, publishers, uh, like, um, our, our, we talked we talked about our friend Scott Hines. Uh, when Gothamist went under, essentially those workers were just completely, you know, screwed. Or when uh, a Gawker just completely shut down their entire operations, uh, or or got got shut down by you know wild lawsuits. There's essentially nowhere for the workers to go. Or more recently, Splinter uh, and many of these other sort of like larger like online outfits. Uh, there would be a lot more of a sort of structure for the workers to not undercut one another, I suppose, and essentially be able to really go into business for themselves if you you know if you think about it yeah we could also um you would see a lot fewer people freelancing because there was no other job to do right. because they would have good protections at their other job right it's freelancing is so often the last resort like most people i know who are freelancers got into freelancing because nothing else worked out Either because they needed the flexibility for some reason, whether it was their spouse had a, it had a job that required flexibility or um, their kids were little and there's no daycare or whatever. Uh, that's why they got into freelancing. 
Or because there was just no other job. I mean, sometimes there's just no other job. You live out in the country somewhere and there's no job. Um, but yeah, it's, again, though, it's like, who cares? Like, mm -hmm. e even if the PRO Act was going to make freelance writing illegal, we're talking about like 10,000 people or something. <laughs> Whereas there are millions of Uber drivers mm -hmm. and there are millions. I've, I've got, because I've been talking about this so much, like my DMs have filled up with just people who are like, yeah, I'm a speech therapist at a school district and they put me at five different schools so they don't have to pay me full time. Or I'm a, you know... I work at a hotel. They they don't they pay me as a freelance hotel desk clerk. Like they're getting away with absolute murder, the companies. Murder. And enough already. So yeah. yeah, I'm worried about them. I'm worried about the dude on the roof who does not have health care. Mm -hmm. Um, or the lady washing hotel sheets who does not have health care, which is an extremely dangerous job, by the way. Washing sheets? I mean, I imagine being no. a cleaner. Yeah. Um, in a hotel because you're using so many big things and lots of chemicals. Like it's very easy to burn yourself. It's very easy to hurt yourself. It's a job that has, it's, it's one of the ones that I like remember from the big list of jobs that are more dangerous than being a cop. <laughs> it's something that I didn't know, but I'm also not surprised by it. Most you know of I mean? them is the answer to that. Most yeah. of them. Yeah. yeah. Bartenders, for example, Chris, you mm -hmm. you're saying something? No, 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 no. Uh, no, I was just dealing with uh, cats okay. and the baby. Oh, well, love to your cat. Um, tomorrow's my, one of my cat's birthday, so uh, we'll be celebrating oh. <laughs> live on air. <laughs> live on <laughs> air. Anyway, um, so I guess as we come down to our last 10 or so minutes, um, we so we're all DSA members, and we're all sort of engaged in a uh, part of a national campaign to pass the PRO Act, and we just started talking about how it's going to manifest in New Orleans. Uh, let's talk about what we're, you know, what, what are, you know, what are the groups that are out trying to get this thing passed and how can people get involved? Locally, you mean? Yeah, yeah, let's talk yeah, about yeah. locally first. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to let you all go ahead because I'm not in New Orleans. All right. Well, um, well, you, you, you're not uh, yeah. come up as a part of a potential part of a April 15th uh, public true. event. Uh, for, that will be done by Democratic Socialists of America in New Orleans, uh, uh, sort of a town hall uh, that people can uh, join into. We should have a link for that coming up very soon. Uh, there's also opportunities to get involved with phone banking with the national organization, uh, which um, I can actually drop a link in here in just a little bit. Uh, you can put that in the description as well for the you know podcast feed. Um, but yeah, um, those are like the two big ways. And maybe talk a little bit about the national campaign. <laughs> Yeah, it's super exciting. I mean, the national campaign, it's maybe, uh, it feels like the first time that I feel like DSA, well, the first time since Bernie, but also I think we might win this one. So it feels like the first time the DSA is like really coming together with a, like this planned campaign that has, oh, 100K. Yeah, no, I mean, DSA has definitely had things, right? Like it's not, DSA 100K was awesome, but this is like a, it just it just has this very cohesive feel, right? Because the two organi uh, sub DSA organizations that are leading it are the DSLC, which is the Democratic Socialist Labor Commission. Is that right? Commission. That's correct. Yep. Um, and the Eco Socialist Working Group um, at a national level, which is really cool because the big like a big argument that we've heard against environmental regulations for a long time is this is going to kill jobs. It's going to kill jobs. People are going to lose jobs. We definitely hear it here in South Louisiana, right? This is going to kill all the oil jobs. We're all going to be broke. It's going to be miserable. It's going to be awful, right? So connecting that with labor, connecting mm -hmm. eco-socialism and labor. Um, and you've seen this come out of the labor movement, you know, with the sort of just transition framework and all this stuff. Super cool, right? Because what we're going to do is we're going to get oil field workers a better job doing infrastructure rebuilding or green energy or some sort of green industry. I don't actually know anything about anything except 50 ways to make your couch prettier, but <laughs> it's going to be really cool. How about 50, um, 50 ways to organize your workplace? Yeah, exactly. 50, you'll never guess this one sneaky trick. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so there's an arc, right? So throughout April, it's um, heavy on education, outreach, um, 
there are phone banks happening to the sort of five dreaded senators who must be pulled over in order for this to be possible. Um, it, the phone bag's huge. We're, I think we passed 300,000 and I think do all three of us have a phone bank shift after we're done with this. I think we yeah, do. Seven o'clock. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, so phone bank, massive phone banks. Um, then there's going to be a May Day, May of action. Mm -hmm. May, day of action, May Day, Day of action, um, where they're going to be presumably, I, I mean, I don't actually know what all is happening. I don't know that all of it has been announced yet, but different chapters are doing different things. Mm -hmm. Some places are going to have marches, some places are going to have online events. Um, I'm sure there'll be banner drops and other good visuals to be sharing around the social medias. Uh, and then, I mean, it's a little bit, I think it's up in the air when it actually goes for a vote. So it's a little bit uh, like, where's the next? But but mm -hmm. the goal is the May, the May 1st day of action is like the big, um, the big thing. So, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I want to second also. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, sorry. I was you know, just just when you're talking about the national stuff. I I, just, I want to second uh, your feeling. Like, I, I think all of us probably volunteered for for Bernie in some way or another during the campaign, and they had a really slick operation um, from the text to the phone banks to the Slack to the different leaders who were doing different parts, and and were able to you know as we know able to mobilize millions and millions of calls and texts and all that kind of thing. And, and it does really feel like I. First of all, I'm grateful to how many DSA organizers worked on Bernie and then came back and brought some of that knowledge with them. You know, shout out to, you know, so many folks. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, the main it does inevitably leave people out because there's so many. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I almost, I almost named a couple of names and then I was like, no, don't do that. Um, but uh, <laughs> there's too many of them. Um, but, but it does, right? Like it feels like one of the, the big, I would say the big, uh, the big boosts of working on Bernie. Um, was the sense that like gosh we can just accomplish so much through collective action nationally not mm -hmm. just you know not just in our usual dsa's had national campaigns but for the most part dsa's heartbeat was in the local work right mm -hmm. and local work is still extraordinarily important those things are not incompatible with each other i just want to get out in front of that because you know how people are but um but like this this feels like wow strength of collective action and you mentioned 100k that was an internal campaign a successful internal campaign that also showed collective action but this is an external campaign and so this mm. is the most like it was with with bernie and the most that shows wow what's beautiful about it and again what was also useful like when i was doing bernie text banking and stuff like that uh my daughter was six months old i mean i was she was she was real real all, like full court press and um but I could still send texts. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about national campaigns like this is that they offer easy access opportunities for people to plug in and do the work. It, it, is, it, isn't, it doesn't cause a resource train. And a lot of times what keeps people away from organizing, even if they're dues paying members of DSA, is that there aren't simple asks and easy entry ways to take action, right? As a parent of a young child, I think about this all the time. Like when I'm not wrapped up in Catholic guilt about not doing enough, I think all the time about like what, <laughs> where, where can I access? What can I do? What can I, you know? And so that's the beauty I think of these big national campaigns is they offer a lot of easy entry points and great trainings for people to mm -hmm. like do the work and like and really get involved. And when you get involved, you feel ownership over it and you feel camaraderie, right? Like that's there's a there is not to get into a thing that I like really still want to suss out in that but there's a spiritual aspect of it to like like feeling this this sense of togetherness with folks, you know? Yeah, and, part of something. Yeah. And that's very meaning to those things. It's yeah, the, 100%, 100 the agree with that. <laughs> online organizing space is also incredibly positive in a way that I have not felt online since Bernie ended, um, which is it's been a really hard year for online toxicity because we're all online all the time, right? And it, it like hurts extra because you don't have anywhere else to go. You can't just go have some brews with your friends. Um, is that a thing people do? <laughs> I don't know, I don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like something exactly, I might want to exactly do with, with the boys. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, the, well, that's so relevant, right? <laughs> but 
But somehow, I don't know. Uh, I don't actually know if like if it's being heavily moderated or what, or if just everybody feels good. Um, but it it's like such like I go to the Bernie to the, to the see. I'm even calling it that. I go to the right. proact Slack just to like <laughs> say hello to all the people who are new. Like hi, welcome. Mm -hmm. I love it. So. Cool. So I guess just uh, kind of wind this down. Uh, how can people get involved in the campaign nationally? Uh, what are some things that people can do? Hold on, I'm gonna sign up for a phone bank shift. Uh, yes. DSA. There will be text bank shifts coming up. Um, mm -hmm. There will be your local chapter is probably doing something. Um, mm -hmm. I I can't know what it is if I don't know what your local chapter is, but if you're in New Orleans, uh, there is a, on April 15th, a uh, uh, public- um, Public town hall, yeah. Town hall, that's the name of it. I was like, it's like a, like, don't say it's a Zoom. It's, it's, it's cooler it's than hall, just a Zoom. Town. It's like, you know, you get out in front of your computer with other people, it's like that. Um, yeah, so that should be really fun. We're going to talk a little bit about Louisiana labor history, which is something that a lot of us don't know anything about on purpose because the bosses don't want you to know about Louisiana labor history. But it's actually there like some legitimately incredible things happen in Louisiana, including like a massive general strike and uh, revolts of enslaved people and all kinds of things. So should be very exciting. Um, We'll talk a little bit about folks who have organized unions in Louisiana, which is very hard to do because it is a right to work state, um, which the PRO Act gets rid of. That's another thing. I don't mean to like go off on this tangent again, but it's it feels really good to me being like way out in the hinterlands where there are, are not a lot of union jobs. Like the only union jobs that there are are nationally unionized companies. Um, so and, you know, like the. Or, or like the postal service, like if you're a, if you're a, a mail carrier, you're in that union. Um, but you don't just like like I'm a an electrician. Should I get an electrician's union job or a non-union job? Which one? Pay? It's like well, no, there are no union jobs, um, which means wages are low and inequality is high and benefits are bad because that's what happens when you don't have unions to fight for you. So it's a really big deal for me to be watching all these comrades from New York and Chicago and Boston and LA and San Francisco, these great union towns, like fighting like hell for me to be able to have a unionized job because that's really what's happening. The, the heavy lifting is happening in the core to benefit the periphery and it doesn't usually go that way, certainly not under capitalism. Right, so it really is very meaningful to me. Anyway, I, I would I would say uh, uh, dsausa.org/proact. Mm -hmm. Sign up on the interest form. Get on the Slack. Take a phone banking shift. Look, we're all in the South, so the Proact would make it so much easier to unionize. It would obliterate right to work. I say, let a thousand Bessemers bloom. You know. <laughs> That very, very, very nice rhetorical flourish there, Mr. Writer Man. Um, and you can also follow Megan on Twitter at Megan Romer. You can follow Chris on Twitter at Curly Writer. Thank you all so much for coming on the show. Uh, you can also uh, listen to Good Morning Comrade every Tuesday to HIV FM 102.3. You can listen to us online. Just go to our website for all of our information, uh, goodmorningcomrade.com. You can also check out our YouTube page, youtube.com. Search Good Morning Comrade, where you can see me talking about the news Monday through Friday, um, sometimes on Saturdays, too. So uh, thanks, for everybody, for joining. Thanks, for everybody, for listening. Love you. Bye. Thanks, Jeff. That was good. All right. Well, I'm going to go do phone banking. Uh, are you going to be on that Yeah, we're probably late. We're probably missing the training. How will we know what to do? It's fine. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke.